Would you like to know how to dry flowers to create everlastings without ending up with a soggy mess and far from pretty flowers that you originally planned? Are you a flower grower who would like to use as many stems as possible so you grow fresh but you're really interested in knowing how you can also dry those fresh flowers and sell them at a later time? So here at Fierce Blooms, we have been growing and drying for years, ever since we started the business, and I won't tell you how long behind. So I'm gonna share with you my top five tips for creating really beautiful everlastings that will really everlastingly last. I grow flowers for fresh, but a lot of us have cut flower gardens and also want to grow and use all of our stems. So everlastings or dried flowers seems a really good option. But there's some really surprising things that you have to do to create beautiful dried flowers that truly are everlasting and will last for many, many years. And one of them, which is a really counterintuitive thing that you wouldn't actually think you need to do, is you need to condition your flowers. What, I hear you cry? Add water to a stem that you're looking to take away from. Well, I know it does seem like it's not the thing to do and the wrong thing to do even to create everlastings. But in my experience, if you fail to condition a flower that is for drying, you can never actually get a beautifully produced everlasting flower. So what I do is I go out and it's mid to late summer now in the UK and I cut my flowers as I would for fresh and I put them straight into water with a 45 degree cut so they soak up all the water. I leave the leaves on but I you know I'll, I'll tell you all about conditioning some other time and then to after 24 hours then I will start to prepare them for drying. And it's a critical step, without which I found I just can't produce a beautiful dried stem. And with my weddings now virtually half being dried flower weddings, then I, I need to actually cut my fresh flowers for drying as well as for fresh weddings. So that's a really critical step. Make sure you properly condition your flowers for drying. I don't use any chemicals, any bleach, any colors, any sprays, any dyes for my everlasting flowers. Frankly, I don't wanna be handling them and I'm really sure that you don't want to be having them in your home or marching down the aisle with you as a bride. So I, I dry them air dry them in particular conditions. So in this summer for uh, this year, it's been ridiculous temperatures and quite frankly, the flowers have dried in no time at all. But the key to drying successfully is to make sure that you don't bunch all the flowers together. So I bunch in tens or if they're big stems in fives, but also you need to have a lot of air circulating around them. So we're here in our drafty, <laughs> our drafty 19th century wharf with all its beams. So it kind of goes back to its old function, if you like, of storage. And I just hang them from the beams with a good distance. But there's two critical things here. They do need to be out of the light unless you want to bleach them naturally in the light, in which case, I'll put them in my glass house and the sun will really bleach them white without the need for chemicals. But generally, I'm looking to retain as much color as I possibly can. So I will dry them in the cool, in the dark, and um, make sure that they are properly spread apart. So that way you don't end up with a fausty mess, which is an absolute disaster. Nobody wants that for a dried flower. It even reta retains the smell of that. And that is really something you want to avoid. I've just started my harvest for this year in late summer, well, tipping into late summer. 
But once you get going, you suddenly realize that there's a lot of stems and there's quite a bit to manage. So obviously I make with my drides all the time and I make wreaths and as I've mentioned, the weddings for drides at the minute are, are proving very, very popular. They're also great for bases, for places where if it's outside and you want to manage uh, a space and you're not sure what the weather's gonna be like, I've done mechanics for say Tatton, um, the RHS flower show with an exhibit that was entirely made out of a base of dried flowers because it needed to last the week. So they're a great um, base mechanic. But how do you store them? So the key thing with storage is to, they need to be wrapped so they don't get crushed. I use boxes and this is the massive thing. I label those boxes. I tend to bunch my flowers, if they are separate colors, into um, color suites. So I don't have to go kind of pulling apart bunches because then you just end up with a mess and you're just not gonna enjoy using them. You want to have them accessible and fairly neat and not taking over your house. So there was <laughs> a year where we actually literally couldn't step across the room because it was just so filled with dried flowers. And I think this year is gonna be another great year for, for drying and the, drying those flowers because I like to um, have an, an option for winter. So if, if you're somebody who's got a cut flower garden and you want to create something, and I'm particularly thinking for winter time and for Christmas, then now is the time that you really need to start to collect those pieces to create your own crafts. So yes, storage is really important. And my top tip to make sure that you don't come down in the morning is to make sure you always tie them with elastic bands because honestly, however tight you pull the string, my experience is I just can't pull it tight enough. And then you're just wasting loads of time as you're kind of picking them all up from the floor. So always tie them with an elastic band and then you won't um, run into that problem. A really important question that I get a lot is when do you cut a stem from a particular plant and in some respects this is a bit of a how long is a bit of string question however there are some overarching principles that I'm going to share with you now and the first of those principles is that you're never going to be able to rescue something that looks dead dried and is gone over by drying it it will just look dead and not very attractive. It's almost the case that if you're going to make an everlasting flower, then they need to be at their peak of perfection. And that is the stage that you cut for an everlasting. You need to make sure that you've got some color, but not too much because they will continue to open. Those flowers will continue to open. And it's particularly the case with helichrysum that if you don't cut them when they're closed enough, they will just blow. And they will also blow when they're dried in very, very dry conditions. So I have learned that I need to dry helichrysum quite slowly. And I, I actually like those really happy, sunny faces for helichrysum but I also like the more densely colored um, uh, uh, closed heads. So you can dry in a couple of conditions. So, so what you need to do when you're looking around your garden is look at things and see when they're reaching their peak of flowering and experiment. Some things are very different in drying than others. Some things will virtually dry as, as exactly as you cut them. Yarrow is one of them, Achillea is another, um, but others will need to be um, in a good floriferous state, for want of a better word, in order to get the best of it. The exception to this is seed heads. The seed heads need to be fully and properly formed, otherwise they will just not dry at all. But also on that seed head front, 
you, they can't be too mature as when you dry them, they will just fall apart. So, so getting the correct stage, it's a little bit of um, experimentation, but mainly it's about knowing when your flowers are at their peak of perfection and then cutting them then. So you've grown some nigella, you've grown some achillea, you've grown some helichrysum, you've grown some alchemilla mollus, you've grown a couple of types of alchilia actually. But what for me makes a really beautiful everlasting dried flower arrangement are some unusual ingredients that you can't very easily get hold of. Because quite honestly, they're all of the main growers are going to be growing your larkspurs and your delphiniums and your rosebuds, but they won't necessarily be growing these very unusual ingredients that you have from your beautiful flowers in your cut flower garden or that you're growing as a flower farmer. So I love to look out for quirky things and a lot of them are seed heads with just some amazing textures um, and really unusual um, stem structures and have a go at drying them. The truth of the matter is that anything and everything can be dried. Sweet peas can be dried. I mean, everybody knows that you can dry hydrangea, uh, the particular varieties, you know, the pinks and the blues, but you can also dry Annabelle hydrangeas. It's just a matter of knowing when to cut them. So, so it's about really looking at the materials that you've got growing in your garden. Scabiosa, I love scabiosa as those beautiful pin cushion flowers, but once they flowered, their seed heads are just exquisite. Now you can get you know, other varieties that are deliberately grown for their seed heads, but have a look out for the little quirky things in your garden, like for example, sedum. Now you would not think that sedum actually dries properly at all because it's a very fleshy plant. However, once you cut it, and I grow a very, very red variety called um, Purple Emperor, once you cut it and leave it for long enough, then it will dry just beautifully. Anything with a very, very saturated color is a thing to choose and experiment with drying. I mean, I could go and list, you know, I, can't, I don't know everything that you're growing in your garden, but do have a go and experiment with different unique things because they will then make your signature for everlasting and dried ingredients. So I've shared with you my five tips for creating the perfect dried flower. So what I do to condition them, how I actually dry them, the storage conditions that I use, when to cut, really important that one. And also having a look out for your own unique, very personal ingredients that you have growing in your garden. So I hope you found something useful about drying in this video. Do subscribe, see you next time.